Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. The Emerging Threats Subcommittee meets this afternoon to receive testimony from the leaders of the U.S. Special Operations Command Service Components. We look forward to hearing how you are shaping our Special Operations Forces in line with the priorities laid out by the National Defense Strategy and what more we can do, what we can do to ensure the readiness of your forces for the range of missions they may be asked to conduct in coming years. First, I'd like to welcome our witnesses today, Lieutenant General Slife, Commander of U.S. Air Force Special Operations Command, Lieutenant General Braga, Commander of U.S. Army Special Operations Command, Rear Admiral Howard, Commander of Naval Special Warfare Command, and Major General Glynn, Commander of U.S. Marine Forces Special Operations Command. I also hope you will pass along our sincere appreciation for the service and sacrifice of the approximately 74,000 men and women of SOCOM and their families. The Special Operations community has achieved so much for the nation in the last 20 years. Uh, but it has also be borne a significant burden in doing so. As our strategic priorities evolve, we must never forget the people that make our Special Operations capabilities so effective. As SOCOM Commander General Clark stated during his posture hearing earlier this month, SOF create strategic asymmetric advantages for the nation across the spectrum of conflict. Their enduring value resides in the ability to adapt and to combat asymmetric threats, including in the gray zone, employ precision and surprise to achieve strategic effects in conflict or crisis, build access, placement, and influence through sustained partnership with foreign forces and support allies and partners, resilience and resistance efforts, all providing discrete options when conventional action is impractical or not desired. General Clark's testimony builds upon the recently released Special Operations Forces vision and strategy that lays out an ambitious 10-year roadmap for realigning special operations capabilities to support the national defense strategy. The threat posed by violent extremists remains present, and our SOF will remain at the forefront of keeping pressure on terrorist networks to prevent them from conducting attacks against our homeland and interests overseas. Successive national defense strategies have rightly emphasized a more resource-sustainable sustain, approach to counterterrorism and long-term strategic competition has become the primary strategic focus. Our special operations forces have a central role to play across the spectrum of competition, crisis, and, if necessary, conflict with our strategic adversaries, even when U.S. forces are not directly involved in hostilities. As has been widely reported, the persistent engagement of U.S. special operations forces with their Ukrainian counterparts over a period of years has undoubtedly contributed to their success in degrading the larger and more heavily armed Russian invasion forces. Without going into details of our current support to the Ukrainian forces, I hope our witnesses today will discuss the lessons learned from our engagement with Ukraine and how they can be applied to shaping our special operations forces for the future. As agile as our SOF community is, adjusting to the demands of long-term strategic competition will not be easy after more than 20 years of sustained counterterrorism and stability operations. Our SOF will require not only new skills and capabilities, but also new operating concepts to make best use of their limited capacity and ensure their activities are fully integrated with conventional and interagency partners, a concept described by the new national defense strategy as integrated deterrence. During today's testimony, I hope you will address how your commands are preparing 
our special operations forces to support the requirements of the geographic combatant commands while balancing the high demand for special operations capabilities around the world. I hope you will also address our efforts to ensure that our special operations forces remain a respected and trusted force by reinforcing a culture of accountability. Last, but most certainly not least, I hope you will update us on efforts to support special operations families as they manage the stress resulting from the frequent and demanding deployment of their loved ones. I'll now turn to our ranking member, Senator Ernst, for any opening comments that she may have. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, gentlemen, for being here today. I apologize for my tardiness. A number of us will have other committees. We'll pop in and out as we can. But again, I appreciate you appearing in front of our subcommittee. And also, thank you for your continued service, um, not just to you, but to your command teams as well. Um, we want to recognize those uh, NCOs and leaders that uh, participate in your roles as well. Um, so, of course, the testimony that you uh, provide today will play an important role in this committee's work on the National Defense Authorization Act. And the men and women of Special Operations Command have been at the forefront of our national security over the last two decades and have undertaken some of the nation's most challenging missions. They've inflicted serious damage to al-Qaeda, to ISIS, and other terrorist groups that want to harm us. And while the counterterrorism mission will remain an enduring requirement for our special operators, the force must transform itself to deal with the growing threat posed by China, by Russia, and other state actors. This will require modernizing the force, updating training and tactics, and employing innovative operational concepts. That is why I included in last year's NDAA a provision requiring a special operations joint operating concept for competition and conflict. I look forward to that being developed and delivered to this committee this year. In order to support efforts to modernize the force, we need to provide them with the resources they need to fight and win in a future fight. President Biden's budget request is woefully inadequate in this regard. The fiscal year 23 top line request for SOCOM is the same as it was last year, despite a significant increase in threats. As we all know, a flat budget equals a budget cut. This reality is only exacerbated by the rising inflation. SOCOM estimates that its fiscal year 23 budget request is actually $1.3 billion or 9% less than its fiscal year 20 budget using constant dollars. This represents a significant decrease in SOCOM's buying power and hampers its efforts to modernize the force. That's why this committee needs to look at SOCOM's unfunded requirements list and do what it can to help address these shortfalls. I hope our witnesses will tell us where they are facing the most pressing shortfalls and describe the impact on their ability to accomplish the mission. Lastly, and most importantly, I want to talk about the greatest capability in SOF, our special operations men and women. As the first soft truth says, humans are more important than hardware. That's why I've been so supportive of the preservation of the Force and Families Initiative. Created after Admiral Olson's testimony in 2011, that the force is, quote, beginning to show some fraying around the edges, end quote. POTUF has been instrumental in taking care of the physical, mental, and spiritual needs of our operators and their families. POTUF truly is a readiness builder for the force. I look to our witnesses to describe how they are using POTUF and other programs to ensure our troops and their families get the support they need. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Ernst. We'll now begin with uh, witness statements. We'll start with Lieutenant General Slife, Commander of U.S. Air Force Special Operations Command. General Slife. Well, good afternoon, Chairman Kelly, Ranking Member Ernst, distinguished members of the committee. I'm honored to appear before you today as the commander of your Air Force Special Operations Command, and I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak about the employment of our nation's special operations forces in the future operating environment. On, my, on behalf of myself and our Command Chief, Chief Master Sergeant Corey Olson, and the 21,500 airmen we served together, uh, thank you for the support and resources 
provided by this committee uh, since our last testimony last year. The National Defense Strategy describes a strategic environment str substantially different from the one in which we've operated for the last two decades. AFSOC, like the other soft components, finds itself at a strategic discontinuity, a moment in which the future should not be considered a linear extension of the past, but rather as something different altogether. Such inflection points require transformation. And my goal today is to describe in greater detail some of the changes we are implementing to ensure our airmen, the disciplined professionals who represent our competitive advantage, remain relevant in the emerging operating environment. As the department embraces integrated deterrence as the framework concept of our defense strategy, the AFSOC of the future will have to balance among five focus areas to compete with our pacing adversaries. First, AFSOC will generate advantage by campaigning in the gray zone, operating across the spectrum of visibility and attribution. We'll use our force to create dilemmas and uncertainty and present cost-imposing problems for our adversaries. For instance, the development of an amphibious capability for our MC-130 transport aircraft will enable runway independent operations, extend the global reach and survivability of the aircraft, and provide access to the enormous portions of the Earth's surface covered by water that doesn't currently exist. Secondly, we'll engage as part of the broader joint force, employing our unique and sensitive capabilities to create windows of advantage and sap adversary strength. In order to do this effectively, we're transforming our training and force presentation models. Our force generation process is made up of four phases, each five months in length. The phases include uh, a reset phase, individual unit training, as well as joint and collective training prior to commitment as part of uh, the joint force. We're pathfinding a new capability that we refer to as mission sustainment teams. These 58-person teams are comprised of 22 different specialties and allow our airmen to out operate out of austere regions with the agility the future operating environment requires. Our airmen will spend the 15 months of the force generation cycle training in skills above and beyond what their normal tasks might entail. The end result is a team of multifunctional airmen integrated into our tactical formations that can provide limited force protection, air transportation services, bed down, subsistence, and operational contracting support, and aircraft and personnel safety to include explosive ordnance disposal. By building these small, agile teams capable of operating in disaggregated fashion in austere sites will create dilemmas and uncertainty for our adversaries. Third, AFSOC will remain poised to respond to global crises and contingencies wherever and whenever required in increasingly contested environments. We're employing our force generation model to produce mission command echelons at a higher state of readiness than previously has been possible. Our force generation model will prepare, train, certify, verify, and validate our airmen and their command teams are ready for alert and deployment taskings. These airmen will be trained to respond to short notice taskings while employing and maneuvering in militarily and politically contested environments. This will reduce the current risk to mission and risk to force by providing continuity of leadership. Fourth, AFSOC will more efficiently disrupt violent extremist organizations to ensure they're unable to mount external attacks on the U.S. homeland and do so in a cost-effective manner. Our armed overwatch programs, light footprint, rapid deployability, multi-mission utility, and much lower operating costs per flight hour will enable AFSOC to do more missions with fewer aircraft than had previously been possible. Finally, AFSOC will remain focused on the specific tasks and missions assigned to SOCOM under the Unified Command Plan and the Joint Strategic Campaign Plan. Chairman Kelly, Ranking Member Ernst, distinguished members of the committee, the nation, the Air Force, and U.S. Special Operations Command appreciate your time today and giving me the opportunity to talk to you just a little bit about the AFSOC of the future. Thank you, General. Uh, Lieutenant General Braga, Commander of U.S. Army Special Operations Command. Go ahead, General. Chairman Kelly, Ranking Member Ernst, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to represent the 36,000 exceptional, exceptional men and women 
of the United States Army Special Operations Command, 2,800 of which are deployed right now across 77 countries. I'm proud to accompany my teammates seated to the left and right of me that I've had the honor and privilege to, with it, to serve in combat. Senator Blackburn, for her behalf, I'd like to thank, on behalf of the entire command, I'd like to thank her and express our gratitude for her support in upgrading Jeremiah Johnson's Silver Star for his valorous actions in Tongo Tongo, Niger. Thank you. Joining me today is Command Sergeant Major Michael Weimer, USASOC Senior Enlisted Advisor. Mike really represents our people. Mike has served the nation for 29 years, deployed to combat 19 times since September 11, 2001. He's carried with him a New York City Fire Department patch as a reminder of our solemn responsibility to protect the nation. On the 20th anniversary of 9-11, we were fortunate to stand with hundreds of our Army Special Operations teammates while Mike returned that same patch that he carried on multiple objectives around the world to the men and women of FDNY on the crowded and emotional streets of Manhattan as a symbol of our solidarity. It's an honor for both of us to serve with the brave men and women of the Army Special Operations community who were the first in and the last out of Afghanistan. As we approach Memorial Day, we are reminded of the selfless sacrifices made by our soldiers and their families over the last 20 years, especially the more than 1,700 Gold Star family members. This year, we will inscribe Staff Sergeant Ryan Knaus, one of our psychological operations warriors, as the 378th name on our wall, and we will never forget. Every component of the Army Special Operations Command contributed in Afghanistan. From our special operations aviators infilling rangers in the dark of night, to our civil affairs teams operating in austere conditions, to Green Berets riding on horseback through the mountains. Your Army Special Operations had an impact and protected the homeland without fail. I assure you we remain vigilant in protecting the homeland as we weight our efforts to the priorities outlined in the National Defense Strategy. USASOC supports the joint force through irregular warfare campaigning for integrated deterrence while simultaneously preparing for high-end conflict. It is vital that we address these challenges with strong interagency, international, and joint relationships to preserve our advantages over our nation's adversaries. Russia's invasion of Ukraine demonstrated President Putin's determination to impose his will in blatant disregard of international norms, rules, and behaviors. Our existing partnerships and forward presence in the region demonstrated strategic value when options were needed. Following the invasion of Crimea, over the last seven and a half years, Army Special Operations deployed to assist our fearless Ukrainian partners in support of building their resistance capability and resiliency. As we apply lessons from this crisis to train, organize, equip, deploy, and campaign, we remain resolute in our resolve to address our nation's most consequential strategic pacing challenge, the People's Republic of China. There is no sanctuary from the scope and scale of the threat. We remain steadfast in our confidence that this generation of Army Special Operations soldiers will build upon the legacy of those who preceded them and uphold our promise to protect the nation without equal. We are committed to maintaining your trust and continuing our complete transparency with Congress and the American people. I thank you for this opportunity and look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, General. Uh, Rear Admiral Howard, Commander of Naval Special Warfare Command. Go ahead, Admiral. Chairman Kelly, Ranking Member Ernst, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to report on the mission readiness of Naval Special Warfare. I'm honored to update you and the American people and humbled to do so alongside Force Master Chief Bill King, who, I'm ser who I've served with for 31 years. My report to the American people is shared with humility, a humility sharpened through the complexity and risk of our mission. The threats that face our nation give us urgency to accelerate distinctive and irregular capabilities from the maritime flanks of our adversaries for integrated deterrence in our nation's defense. I am confident that we are delivering the disruptive and necessary change to be ready for what the nation will ask of our force. Our comparative advantage is our people, this nation's greatest treasure. Our SEAL operators, combatant craft crewmen, warfighting support teammates, and families, who, 
alongside our Gold Star families, form a highly reliable team. The team fused together and enrolled with the common purpose, trust and candor, creativity and resilience. We fortified a culture of continuous assessment and development and designed new character, cognitive and leadership attribute assessments across the career continuum. We've implemented and improved a more rigorous selection for all leaders, officers and senior enlisted, <clears throat> a process that includes psychometric testing, peer and subordinate assessments, and a double-blind selection panel leveraging data science and counter-bias approaches to increase precision and objectivity of leader selection and assignment decisions. We recognize diversity as one of our greatest sources of strength to solve the hardest problems. And we are making significant investments with the Navy to directly engage communities that are underrepresented in our formation. We built the sustainable architecture to proactively seek out candidates that may not have historically thought of joining our ranks. Since my last report, we graduated our first female combatant craft crewman and tripled female cadre across all phases of the assessment selection pathway to bolster development of women in naval special warfare. Delivering a more lethal and survivable force requires that we evolve and adapt faster than our adversaries. Over the past year, we developed a plan to substantively increase investment in the modernization of exquisite cross-domain capabilities that provide the access and effects we must have as a nation to persistently hold peer adversaries' critical targets at risk. We are now holding approximately a third of our force in reserve to more agilely respond to emerging global missions. <coughs> and critically, to conduct the urgent experimentation with innovative mission concepts for step changes in tactics and advanced technologies. Technologies that include artificial intelligence, autonomous multi-domain unmanned systems, and cyber electronic warfare and kinetic effects. As the Navy's commandos, we are tightly linked with fleet commanders, allies, partners, and U.S. government agencies to create a regular warfighting advantage for the joint force and generate uncertainty in adversary confidence, escalation off ramps, and greater leverage for our civilian leadership in crisis. Master Chief King and I are proud of our force and their service to protect and defend our great nation. We will continue to be humble stewards of the incredible trust that you and the American people place in us, and we thank you for your continued support of our team and Naval Special Warfare's families. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, Major General Glynn, Commander of U.S. Marine Forces Special Operations Command. Good. Thank you, Chairman Kelly, and Ranking Member Ernst, and other distinguished members of the committee. Thanks for the opportunity and up to update you on the status and posture of Marine Corps Forces Special Operations Command. And it's an honor for Sergeant Major Loftus and I to join you again this year alongside my fellow soft component commanders and their senior enlisted leaders. Since we met last year, MARSOC maintained a persistent forward deployed presence in support of six named operations across the globe. And Marine Raiders conducted operations in Indo-Pacific Command, Central Command, and Africa Command, while episodic deployments in support of European and Southern commands. Our mission tailored forces continue to maximize efficiency while remaining faithful stewards of resources and continue to account for significantly more of the missions performed than the size of the force, 3,500, and slice of the budget, budget would predict. As you've heard from the geographic com combatant commanders, they're increasingly challenged in the uncertainty of semi-permissive environments as our adversaries seek to gain and maintain influence in the gray zone. MARSOC is leveraging our organizational agility, predominantly our size, to maximize the effectiveness of the force and provide immense benefit to the soft enterprise and our parent service. Competition requires special operations forces that can be active in the gray zone and win in conflict, for which your Marine Raiders are postured and focused. In fact, it's our quest to bring transparency to the gray and gray zone. Over the past year, we've further developed our innovative operating concept that provides the nation with a unique capability. 
Strategic shaping and reconnaissance encompasses a wide range of capabilities from cooperation with partners and allies to increasing costs to adversaries to deter, disrupt, and deny their objectives. The operational art of SSR, strategic shaping and reconnaissance, seeks to connect the joint interagency, intergovernmental, and multinational communities as they des develop persistent networks that can enhance strategic intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. The concept supports multi-domain campaigning for long-term shaping and influence in support of SOCOM, the Joint Force, and the nation in strategi strategically critical locations. As one example, over the course of the last year, MARSOC provided soft peculiar capabilities to the Theater Special Operations Command for AFRICOM while connecting the combat power of the, fifth, of the Marine Corps' 15th Marine Expeditionary Unit to provide capability and capacity in support of current operations off the coast of Africa. This demonstrated the possibilities in a domain approach include, that includes forward-based soft operating in the littorals that can connect air, maritime, and cyber elements, in this case of a Marine Expeditionary Unit off the coast of Somalia to maintain pressure on violent extremists while supporting our regional partners. As we experiment with emerging and next generation capabilities, operations against violent extremist organization networks continue and provide our forces the placement and access with partners and allies against priority threats. We pursue missions in littoral regions that facilitate close ties to the naval force that include fleet marine forces. Our ability to leverage these characteristics is integral to our expanding impact as part of what our Commandant calls the stand-in force, necessary at the persistent forward edge of deterrence. We recognize that the current and future operational capabilities rest upon a foundation that we all have in common, outstanding Marine Raiders and their families. To maximize continued excellence and enable new operational concepts, we must continue to safeguard and sustain our most valuable resource through programs we discussed in some detail last year, specifically preservation of the force and family, sexual assault and prevention, and diversity and inclusion initiatives. Each are in a different point of maturity, yet they contribute to a collective organizational culture of physical, mental, spiritual, and family excellence to enhance mission success and strengthen family resilience. In closing, we remain committed to providing the joint force with Marine Raiders that possess unique special operations capabilities who are threat-focused, devoted to force modernization, and whose actions continually demonstrate our motto, Spiritus Invictus, or Unconquerable Spirit. On behalf of the men and women of MARSOC, I thank the committee for your continued support to those in uniform and their families, and for your commitment to our national security. Thank you. Thank you, General, and thank you to all of you for your statements. I'll begin our first uh, round of questions uh, for five minutes here. And this first question is for all four of you. Uh, and since we only have five minutes, we'll have to keep it uh, brief. Um, for much of the last uh, two years, the department has been refining a joint warfighting concept that uh, finds a credible theory of victory should deterrence fail with a near peer adversary. However, our long-term strategic competitors continue to make gains through hybrid war, war, warfare and coercion below the threshold of tr traditional armed conflict. As you all have pointed out in your statements, our SOF have a key role to play in this type of warfare. So as you look at what will be asked of our special operations forces for the next, say, 10 to 15 years, what do you believe will be the most important skill sets and capabilities, and which of these will be the most difficult to develop? And we'll start with General Slythe. Thank you, Senator. Uh, as integrated deterrence is the framework concept, one of the things that we talk about in AFSOC is that deterrence is the noun and integrated is the adjective. Deterrence is the thing we're trying to do, but integrated is how we're going to do it. And I think when you th think about what integration means, there is no force in the DOD that is more integrated than SOF. Uh, we're jointly interoperable at much lower levels. All four of us have operated with one another in combat since, the, since we were much, much uh, more junior in our careers. And so SOF is integrated internally. Furthermore, SOF has a set of relationships around the globe, both with partner militaries 
and also with embassy teams uh, that is unrivaled. AFSOC was, was uh, present in 74 countries since the last time uh, we had the opportunity to speak to this committee. And finally, across the U.S. government, no part of the DOD uh, force is more connected to the interagency and the intelligence community than our special operations forces. So I think that is going to be where our competitive advantage lies, is our ability to integrate uh, internally across the U.S. government and also with our partners. Thank you. General Braga. Uh, Senator, I'd, I'd echo the critical importance of making sure we work with our international partners and intel community and interagency. It's, uh, it's, it's even more important as we face strategic challenges of China and Russia. Uh, we have to rethink everything we do, how we live in the contact layer, and look, seek to provide options, both in during competition and should it transition to high-end conflict, how do you survive, how do you shoot, move, and communicate, how do you live in a different electromagnetic spectrum that our adversaries invested very heavily in. So we are re-looking really everything from our capabilities to how we train people to ensure their survivability, uh, still maintain a focus on smaller units of action, having an outsized effect, uh, be able to operate, though, in austere locations with those partners in the contact layer. Admiral. Our contribution to integrated deterrence is principally the irregular ways and means that we deter our peer adversaries. We are prioritizing irregular partners, irregular global partners, irregular uh, denied access capabilities for hard targets, irregular and scalable effects. Uh, in terms of capabilities that, that uh, you know, support uh, this effort, uh, lethal and survivable access platforms, both on the surface and the subsurface uh, uh, domains, unmanned systems that are increasingly autonomous and interoperable, and then cyber and electronic warfare. Thank you. General? Senator, as you're aware, de deterrence and deterrence theory can get, can get pretty complicated, but the, the biggest thing is the most significant thing in deterrence that we find as has been alluded to, comes from our allies and partners and their perspective of, of risk. And, and what, is, what is most risky to our adversaries, be they China or Russia? And so the, the most important part of deterrence is going to remain the relationships and the allies and partnerships that we, we specifically invest in in the special operations community. To the other half of your question, the hardest part, I believe, is, the, is going to be the technical aspects of we've all already alluded to information operations and cyber capabilities and, and there's been one allusion to space thus far that those are that's going to take education and training over time that's a substantial investment on all of our parts well thank you I, when when general general slife mentioned the ace or the mc-130 amphibious operations i thought that might be on the list an air force guy landing on potentially landing on an aircraft carrier might be a skill set that would be hard to develop. Um, uh, and I'm very... It's easy. All right. uh, <laughs> um, well, thank you for that. And I'll now recognize Senator Ernst for five minutes. Thank you so much. And of course, as we all sat down and visited uh, during your office calls, we talked extensively about POTUF. And so maybe in my second round of questions, I can ask each of you a little bit more about POTIF and, and your specific programs. But General Slife, there was something that you brought up in your office call that I would love to hear a little bit more about um, your, your efforts within POTIF to address the moral hazard. And it's something that I hadn't put a lot of thought into, but if you could explain to the members of our, our subcommittee what your intent would be as you continue to delve into this area. Well, thank you, Senator. I'm happy to do it. Uh, the conversation that Senator Ernst and I had yesterday, we talked about the three types of invisible wounds that many of our service members suffer from because of their experiences over the last 20 years. Uh, the first one is neurocognitive injury, and so this is, this is really uh, uh, TBI, uh, concussive effects, those types. It's a, it's a physical uh, damage to the brain, and so we, we understand that. We are focused on that. SOCOM has a, a DOD-leading program around neurocognitive health. 
The second invisible injury is psychological injury, and this manifests as post-traumatic stress. It is the uh, manifestation of, of witnessing or being part of a significantly traumatic event and the long-term effects that has on you. But I think there's a third type of invisible injury, and it's, and it's moral injury. And these are the injuries that are incurred when we act in a way that is contrary to our moral system, and we do damage to, we do our damage to ourselves as we reflect back on the things that we have done over the last 20 years. And so I, I've uh, experienced some of this myself, having made decisions in the moment to take people's lives that I then, you know, afterwards wonder, was that the right decision? Uh, it seemed like the right decision at the time, but what, what does that mean to me now? And so as we've uh, looked at moral injury as a third type of this uh, um, uh, invisible wounds kind of uh, triad, uh, we have been engaged directly with the Air Force to invest in that leg of our POTIF program uh, that would attend to these moral injuries. And we have gotten a uh, commitment from the Air Force to embed a religious support team, a chaplain and a chaplain uh, assistant, NCO, into every squadron level formation in Air Force Special Operations Command. This doesn't exist anywhere in the Air Force. It, it, you know, I had to uh, work hard with the Air Force to get there, uh, but, but we do have that uh, program coming down the pike. And so I, that's a big win for us in the, in the POTA front, and uh, with, coupled with some of the other things that may, we may talk about, Senator, uh, those are that that's really the answer to your question. Yeah, no, thank you, General Slife, and I'm anxious to hear more about that as you continue to develop that. And uh, General Braga, thank you so much um, again uh, during the office call. Uh, you had the opportunity to visit with me and my team about the Ukrainian uh, forces that you have been able to train and work with over you know, seven years or so. It was an investment that now we see as paying large, large dividends. And what are the follow-on risks from the invasion, uh, in particular when we look at Moldova and Kosovo? And just in your judgment, where do we need to expand our footprint and presence in UCOM? Well, ma'am, certainly I don't want to speak for UCOM and... Uh... Uh, their current prioritization, but I would say we have had long-standing generational relationships in some places across Eastern Europe, both NATO and non-NATO countries, that I think uh, pay uh, huge dividends in return on investment for honestly small amounts of physical footprint on the ground uh, as we expand their capabilities. We've mentioned resistance and resiliency, but it's also interoperability. It's that, and, and I believe uh, Senator Kelly mentioned that expanding the access, presence, and influence, and. When I mentioned the scale and scope of the threat of Russia and China, we won't be able to do this alone. That's why I talk about the international partners and increasing their capacities and their capabilities so critical. And that's from information operations, that's unconventional warfare, that's asymmetric uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures that you're seeing unfold right now in the Ukraine. Uh, I won't go into the, in, in this forum, but would, would uh, be absolutely willing to go into a, a, perhaps a closed door session of other partnerships we are expanding right now, and certainly the, the world is paying attention to the, uh, what's unfolding in Ukraine that is adding emphasis to that. Wonderful. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Senator Kane. Um, th thank you to all of you. Your testimonies, a couple of points that I find interesting and just kind of underlined. Uh, General Glenn, you talked about when you were asked about deterrence, you said, that, you know, the lead deterrence we have is our network of alliances and partners, and it truly is an edge where Russia and China, they're just not really in the same ballpark with us on that. They, they do not have that network, and now they're seeing how powerful a network of alliances can be, so that's a takeaway. And then, General Bragg, I like the fact that you started with talking about your uh, uh, enlisted leader colleague carrying the FDNY patch for 20 years, because it has been 20 years where I think we have leaned really heavily on special forces, sort of disproportionate to your slice of the budget or the size of the of the manpower component, we lean very heavily on you. So I have really one question that would take much longer than five minutes to answer, and maybe I'll start General Glenn and go right to left around the table from my side. During this 20 years, we lean very heavily on you, largely in missions against non-state terrorist organizations. They've had a lot of lethal capacity, but they haven't had the ability to like challenge us in the air, challenge our communications dominance, 
challenge some other uh, just strong areas of expertise we have as we're now looking at a national defense strategy that focuses on peers that do have the ability to, you know, not have a permissive air environment or, or challenges on the communication side. I suppose as special operations leaders, you have to think about new strategies and make new investment decisions too to recognize the reality of that kind of a challenge. Talk a little bit about how within your commands, you're sort of looking at the battle against, you know, great state competition and how that affects the, the planning and investment decisions you make. Thank you, Senator, for that question. And it, I'll, I think I'll tee it up, and then as we go around the horn, we can probably expand on it. Um, the, the notion of the gray zone is, is I guess, where I'll start. It, and it, it's defined as gray for a reason, because it, it's where if, if we looked at ourselves for 20 years and decided how we would want to combat the strengths that the United States brings in, in, the, in the manner in which we have for the last 20 years, we would probably come to many of the conclusions that our, that our strategic adversaries have as well. And so, to your question, the, the choices that we're having to determine right now is what of the, the counterterrorism skill sets, the, the stuff that we've invested and developed very well over the last 20 years, how much of it translates, how well does it translate, and what else do we need to be able to do? And, and having you know, stood alongside these gentlemen in the past, I think I'll conclude for the moment with our examination of cyber capabilities, our examination of space capabilities, and that and the integration with special operations going forward to, to take to narrow that gray zone. Mm -hmm. If you'll allow me to stop there, yes. I know I know. Admiral Howard, of... you and I have talked about the cyber dimension of this before, but I'd, I'd I'd love to hear your answer on this as well. We have, and with with cyber and electronic warfare. With our proximity access to hard targets, we, we see ourselves as part of that, that kill chain uh, in extending the reach of the cyber and electronic warfare enterprises. But we're clearly at an inflection point. Nationally, I think within special operations, we're entering, I call it the fifth modern era of special operations. For naval special warfare, we, we over-rotated on counterterrorism, clearly. Uh, and we, we, we lost some ground in the distinctive things that only we can do. And, and we are moving with urgency to make the main thing the things that only we can do in the maritime domain. I'd also say that uh, we are investing in time and space to conduct uh, experimentation and concept development with combat-validated forces. And that's important to, to embrace uh, what's in front of us, put pressure on ourselves, and, and deliver step changes. Mm -hmm. Move faster, learn faster. We can do that at lower training risk with combat-ready forces. And, and then finally, uh, the fleet integration, and using the fleet and the joint force to, to red-team ourselves in terms of survivability and lethality. Please. General Senator, I'll just mention two to add on there. First, uh, information advantage and information operations. I think we're you know, watching it daily, the strategic impact that it has. I, I cannot envision a future where that does not increase in importance, affecting target audiences, general populations, governments, armies, morale, and, and eroding their overall fe effectiveness. Secondly, I mean, we, we've started a campaign of learning, the other component commanders mentioned it, but I really look at soft space and cyber as the modern day triad. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think we owe you best military advice and options and the and National Command Authority uh, for flexible deterrent, flexible response options that involve and optimize those three legs of the triad for options, both in deterrence, but also maintaining dominance in the domains for high-end conflict to the and supporting the joint force. I'm out of time, but can I let General Slife answer? Are you okay, Coach? Th thank you. Thanks, Senator. I'll just briefly uh, highlight one other thing. You know, uh, I believe that the service components of SOF are most effective when we are closest to our parent services. And I think you've heard some of that from Admiral Howard talking about his relationship with the fleet. It, it's no different for us. And so I think one of the places where we see a value proposition for SOF is enabling our, joint, particularly in, uh, in conflict-type scenarios, enabling our broader service uh, uh, you know, parents uh, to be effective. And so I think you know, for AFSOC, uh, there's a lot of work to be done in the um, integrated air defense um, area as well as the counter space uh, mission area. There are a lot of very um, critical capabilities that our adversaries rely on in those areas that I think SOFIT brings unique capability to affect. Great. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Senator Tuberville. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, thanks for being here today. 
Uh, thank you for your service and such a t tough time for the world that we live in. Uh, this is for all of you. Uh, uh, what resources, if any, have you asked for but not have been provided? And I'm asking it for this reason. In November 2020, Acting Secretary of Defense Chris Miller enacted the FY 2017 NDA requirement to elevate the SOLIC position to be on par with other service uh, secretaries. But last May, Secretary Austin reversed this decision, burying SOLIC uh, back under the Under Secretary of Defense for policy. SOLIC is still understaffed and isn't getting the routine direct access to the Secretary and De Deputy Secretary it should, as directed by the NDAA. So just any comments any one of you have on that? General, I'll start with you. Senator, thank you. Uh, so. You know, each year, I think we find ourselves trying to balance our uh, our budgeting recommendations among modernization, readiness, personnel programs, th these types of things. And every year we come up, you know, short. I think we could all find uh, additional areas where we would like to invest in order to reduce risk. Uh, the, the budget that was submitted, I think Senator Ernst uh, described some of the fiscal realities of it. Uh, but it represents a balance of risk among those areas. And, uh, the, you know, to directly answer your question, um, I think each of us have uh, contributed to the SOCOM commander's unfunded priority list, which uh, reflect those areas where if additional resources were available, those would be the things we would recommend that Congress might consider investing in. Thank you. General? Senator? At ECHO, we've uh, submitted that in the uh, Congressional Unfunded Priority List, and it, it touches upon a lot of the, some of the capabilities you were talking about previously. But uh, there is absolutely an impact if you just take inflation uh, alone. Inflation alone has certainly affected our supply chain no different than any other facet of society right now. I mean, the average uh, uh, increase in parts, we're talking for our helicopter fleet, has gone up 31 to 35 percent. And that, that, that comes at a trade off. So there's always trade offs and prioritization decisions to be made, rebalance, risk to force, risk to mission, uh, training readiness, or deploying, you know, through operations, activities, and investments. So that's continual, but just like the rest of the world, we're dealing with that, that impact of, uh, of inflation right now uh, with, uh, as Senator Ernst said, the, uh, the flat budget. Thank you. Adam? What's before the Congress now is uh, an opportunity within Naval Special Warfare to, to make some additional investments. In denied area access across the maritime flank, where we maintain comparative advantage with peer adversaries, irregular and scalable kinetic and non-kinetic effects, so a suite of effects across uh, a, a range of attribution options there, and uh, the survivability and lethality of, of our subsea and, and, and surface platforms. Uh, so we, we're given the the. Uh, uh, Opportunity to, to make some some uh, growth in our community, you know, pending uh, the congressional uh, uh, judgments. There, uh, we're 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 on the right trajectory for uh, what I outlined before in terms of what we're what we're aiming for for a regular deterrence. Senator, thanks for the opportunity to uh, to comment on it. I, I would say that the most acute area, the place where we face. The hardest choices, and, and they're well known at ASD Solik and, and at the SOCOM level, it, it's a good, that's a good team. It, it's a good relationship that supports all of us, I believe. But it, where it really comes down to the hard choices and we, when we have to make choices between equipment and people. And I think you heard that in our opening statements. And, and what do I mean by that? Modernization, the investment in, in, in the technology that's required to compete with the likes of Russia and China, well, taking care of current operations and supporting the force and the family. And I think that, that's, that's somewhat where we're at now in terms of how will we pay for modernization going forward. Thank you. Just one more quick question here. A recurring theme here in the Senate is that our commanders in the field don't have enough ISR. Uh, just your quick thoughts, you know, commercially, you know, the available options such as MAXR, uh, what, what capabilities do they bring? Anybody got any thoughts on that? Senator, I, I would offer to you that uh, commercial capabilities are um, growing at a rate that rivals organic military capabilities, and I think a key part of our ISR 
enterprise going forward is going to be leveraging the various modalities of intelligence collection available from, from orbit. Uh, so I, I'm interested in pursuing every one of those as part of a holistic uh, um, air and space-based ISR architecture. Anybody else got a thought on MAXR or any other capabilities? Sir, as, as Senator, as the world becomes more connected, we need to rethink modern day uh, ISR. So it's not just from things in orbit, obviously Leo, Neo in, in space, but also just how the world becomes more connected and rethink uh, and experiment with ways to have better situational understanding out there. Again, I think soft can be part of that solution uh, with our innovative type mindset of employing commercial capability as well as government procured capability. Adam Hired, have you heard of sail drone? Yes, I have. What do you think about it? The unmanned capabilities are absolutely critical for multi, uh, for autonomous systems that, that give us uh, situational awareness, decision dominance, and in the case of that platform, specifically maritime domain awareness. General Glenn, you got anything to say about it? I, I would offer, Senator, that I, I think when we think ISR, we typically think of that, that vehicle. And really, General Slife is the one who's educated me over the course of the last year that, that really the way forward, we need to think about the, the manner in which those vehicles are controlled rather than a single operator with a, with a single control system on a single platform, often referred to as swarming. But how will a single operator through a control system have access to any number of platforms that can do what's needed when, when it's needed? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go through our uh, next round, five-minute questions. Uh, I want to start with Admiral Howard, uh, talk a little bit about undersea capabilities here. You, it's uh, you know pretty much understood that our undersea capability is uh, we've got a comparative advantage to Russia and China uh, and the ability to operate uh, under the ocean. Uh, and I understand this is one of SOCOM's priority investment areas for fiscal year 23 uh, is the development of a new undersea insertion and exfiltration capability. So, Admiral, can you just kind of, you know, step through us here, uh, how the development process is going, how you're working with SOCOM uh, to extend the undersea reach of naval special operators, and um, also a little bit about uh, integration. Uh, with the uh, regular Navy. You know, often uh, as you're developing a system and you're trying to, you know, get it to work with, you know, something you might not, uh, uh, it's not part of the development program, but it needs to work with existing hardware that can be a challenge. So if you can comment on that as well. Thank you. Our relationship with our submarine force has never been closer. Uh, and we we learned from working with our submarine force. You know, they're an exemplar of a highly reliable organization, which we always strive to be. Uh, we also have an advantage as a country in the undersea with our allies and partners. I was recently in Europe with several of our allies, uh, where we uh, are, are collaborating on new capabilities and combined operations. The uh, for for acquisition and oversight and you know, execution and due diligence of these programs. We're investing with SOCOM and SOCOM's ATNL inside of my own command uh, so that we uh, bolster the uh, workforce around the execution of the program. The integration that, that is, we have a dependency with the Navy. There's great alignment with Admiral Gilday's staff in the, in the OPNAV N9 uh, under Admiral Khan. And, uh, and then, of course, at, at NAVC. I'm confident that we're on a trajectory to deliver the nation capabilities that are, are distinctive and access the denied targets in a way that's uh, uh, survivable and, and persistent. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, you know, some of the uh, requirements that unclassified, you know, what you're looking for uh, in this system and how the... Uh, integration with the Navy is going. I know in, you know, prior, prior you know, systems we have had uh, difficulty integrating um, hardware onto, you know, submarines, and I want to make sure that that's not something we 
uh, encounter here with this program? We're, we're on the right course in, in, in that regard uh, with the Navy uh, to expand the kinds of capabilities that we can integrate onto our uh, submarine hosts. Uh, with future capabilities, we're looking at extended ranges, the extended uh, increasing payloads, uh, teaming with unmanned systems. I mean, that's, that's generally our strategy. Uh, we see the undersea is absolutely critical to deterrence. I think it's a place that we maintain advantage, and it's, and it's a place where we must maintain advantage to credibly deter our peer adversaries. All right, thank you. Um, Senator Blackburn. Right. Thank you. Uh, and thank you all. We appreciate your time uh, so incredibly much. Uh, General Braga, thank you for your time yesterday. We appreciate that. And we talked a lot about China and the Chinese Communist Party. And I want to talk a bit more about that because, I, as you know, when we look at what is happening with this new axis of evil, Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea, and look at the way that Russia and China and North Korea also with hypersonics, the way they're looking at space and nuclear and cyber and hypersonics, um, autonomy. Uh, the, there are concerns that uh, have arisen. So talk to me a little bit about how you're leveraging uh, early research in emerging technologies to prevent some of the technological surprises across different war fighting domains. And how are you drilling down on that? Because it's going to require an intentionality that sometimes may not have been required in um, other disciplines. Uh, thank you, Senator, uh, for the opportunity to discuss that. I think one of the transferable lessons learned from uh, the last couple of decades is the power of uh, network analysis and network defeat and identifying critical vulnerabilities, whether it's a supply chain or a high-end uh, weapon system as the, really the whole joint force is looking at uh, maintained dom dominance, whether it's JADC2 or the joint warfighting concept. Uh, SOFT's role in that is, is uh, I think, clearly to seek out some of those vulnerabilities, work amongst our joint force partners and, and, and specifically uh, in support of the geographical combatant commands, but leveraging perhaps the other strengths of, uh, I mentioned earlier about uh, cyber and space for more holistic effect to hold at risk some of their critical vulnerabilities and nodes, be it in C5 uh, ISRT, their mission command platforms or, or weapon systems. Um, would would absolutely appreciate the opportunity in a, in a closed door session to go more into more detail at some of some of the uh, operational aspects that we are looking at, uh, but but make no uh, uh, have have confidence that we are we are continually experimenting and looking at and analyzing how to best take advantage of those. Uh, learn more first, and then look how to take advantage of those possible vulnerabilities in support of the joint force. And I think it would be helpful to hear from each of you. Um, and you can just give this to us in a written response. I think it's probably a bit too much for here. And then we can dig a little deeper um, on that in a closed session at some point. But hear from each of you where you feel like there are shortfalls in capacity and capabilities, and then how we need to change. Uh, as each year we're working on the NDAA, and as we change that focus to look at what we're going to do in the future, how we're going to utilize um, new capabilities, hypersonics, how we're going to utilize some of the technological innovation that is coming our way. I, I think it would be helpful to us as we go through to figure out, you know, where you all see, where, where the difference is in what we perceive and what you're dealing with every day as you are uh, going about your task. So if I could ask you all for a written response. 
I would appreciate that. Um, I also want to turn a little bit to AI and assisted decision making. Um, we have, I would say probably at this point, because of ISR, we have volumes of data and video feeds that could be used in, um, to establish really kind of a routine and also an abnormal activity line. And I think it is important for us to know how you all are using big data analytics to look at this and how you are going to expand the utilization of big data in order to accommodate um, and backfill limited personnel. And knowing what you're going to do with those analytics and how you're going to utilize AI would be helpful to us. And um, I guess I've got five pages of questions here and I am out of time. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, I'll send it back to you and we'll have some things for the record. Thank you all. Thank you, Senator, and Senator Ernst. Yes, thank you so much. Um, and I'm going to go right back to POTUF. And I think as we have all sat down and, and visited about the things that are important for our forces, especially in uh, the realm of SOCOM, it does come back to preservation of the force and family. And so uh, I know, General Slife, we had started with you. You talked a little bit about moral injury and what you're doing to um, combat those effects. And what I would like for each of you to do as well is talk a little bit about POTIF and if you have any special initiatives that you have started uh, we would love to hear about those, as well as other avenues that would you, you would like to see adopted throughout your forces. Um, so, uh, General Slive, do you have any additional that you would like to add? And then we'll go to uh, General Braga. Briefly, Senator, I will tell you that in our, uh, so POTIF resourcing is appropriately uh, spread a little unevenly across AFSOC, as some of our units have greater demands for one aspect than another. Uh, but one thing that we have generally seen is the units with POTIF uh, resources embedded at the unit level mm -hmm. have lower instances of uh, ill discipline. They have lower instances of um, sexual assault and sexual harassment. They have lower instances of suicidal ideation or mm -hmm. attempted suicides. And so based on some of this, uh, there, there's certainly a correlation. We're not yet sure about causation. We continue to collect mm -hmm. data to be able to draw that. Uh, but based on uh, the very positive results we've seen out of our POTA program, uh, there is an increase in uh, AFSOC's uh, POTIF investment. We have taken internal offsets in order to increase our POTIF resourcing across more of our units inside of AFSOC because of the very positive results we've seen. That's good. Go where they are. Yeah, thank you. How about you, Sasak? Senator, first of all, thank you for your stalwart uh, support of POTIF over the years. It's uh, the men and women of USOC, absolutely thank you. Uh, I think it's been easy to sell when you show the, the physical manifestation of someone who's had a grievous physical wound, uh, and, and we've had those type of vignettes. But I, th I do think we need a better job on the data collection uh, you know, phase of it. So we are starting different initiatives to, from our baselining our incoming uh, students. Again, we have about 3,000 at any one time at, at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, going through our school system and, and identifying like a digital uh, profile of them to help them be the best possible person they can be across all pillars of, of, of POTIF. Uh, we're investing and uh, in trying to be more data driven, even on spiritual residency and in, in, in falling in line with the Army's lead for spiritual assessment. Uh, tool, which is, is at least in the academic research, proven to increase resiliency and lower rates of depression and, and suicide and the like. I am a personal huge believer of the behavioral health uh, impact that our both our operational psych, uh, uh, psychologists and uh, uh, clinical workers have just made an untold amount of impact. And, and when we even look at our formation from suicidal ideations and the like, we have a lower rate of, of usage rate for acute care 
for those coming into the formation who have been uh, specifically assessed and selected and those who have just been assigned to uh, United States Army Special Operations Command. Uh, but we need to do a better job on the data collection, get that to uh, really everyone to, to tell the story, the good news story of POTIF. So we're making efforts in that uh, to not only with Smarter Base, the SOCOM solution, but also human counsel, a human factors dashboard that we're working on at the USASOC level. Thank you. Admiral? No, thank you. One of our uh, data advantage capstone initiatives is, is around POTIF and uh, understand, you know, seeing the data in a way where we can uh, uh, more accurately articulate measures of effectiveness, understand needs. Uh, you know, I would just say uh, tremendous effort on our team to de-stigmatize de uh, mental health issues. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the care that we have embedded is, is transformational for, from our op psychologists to our chaplains, and an emphasis on neurocognitive health as well. And then lastly, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, uh, just say that uh, veteran health and, and extending, thinking about POTIF mm -hmm. into our, our veteran population, this is where we're partnering with outside of government entities and, and bringing those best practices to our veteran teammates. Yeah, great. Thank you, Admiral. General Glenn. Senator, I'll, I'll likewise thank you for your continued support of POTIF. I, I think I'll, what I'll, I'll take a different tack than just flag an area where I, I think all of us should pay attention. With, with, the, um, with the shift in the future of what military health care is likely to be, we, we find ourselves focused on, on potential gaps between POTIF as, we, as we've known it and the areas where it has extended that and, and the, our need to walk it back, if you will, to, mm. to build, fill in gaps that, that seem to be created. And, I, and I'll give you an example. We've, you've heard several references to mental and behavioral health. That, that, that specialty care is an area that we're paying very close attention to going forward. Because you can see that that's going to be a persistent need. Okay. And, and access to that is, I know it's challenging across the enterprise, not just military health care, mm. but that, that's, that's an example of an area. I, on the plus side, we talked about this in office call, but for wider awareness, SOCOM's investment in our, our opportunity to, to work on the cognitive performance side, mm -hmm. our ability to baseline folks who join MARSOC, and now we can watch them over time, is already interesting. I think it's going to become fascinating over the course of five to ten years. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you all so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Um, so I just returned from uh, visiting our allies and and service members a uh, couple stops uh, in Poland and in Germany it's clear that US special operations forces you know can act as a significant mul force multiplier uh, for our strategic partners um, including when facing off uh, some well-armed adversaries and I think nowhere is this more apparent than in what's going on in Ukraine today uh, as I mentioned, and I think you, uh, General Braga mentioned during uh, our opening remarks, um, reports have indicated that uh, Putin's army here is stalled in Ukraine um, because of the direct support in training uh, special operations forces uh, of, of the Ukrainian military. Um, since... Uh, the invasion of Crimea in 2014. So, General Braga, I know that you can't comment, you know, on any specifics in this training, but can you discuss some of the lessons learned from Ukraine regarding the use of Army special operations capabilities as the U.S. military continues uh, in this pivot towards great power competition with Russia? Uh, Senator, thank you for the opportunity. Uh I think there's lots of lessons learned that can be applied elsewhere, although other parts of the globe are not certainly the, the same. Um, from our information ops and psychological operations, civil affairs teams on, on the ground right now working with the uh, multitude of international non-government organizations supporting the people of Ukraine, and certainly our special forces uh, uh, teams who have, have been there, again, for multiple years now helping them. I mean, the credit really goes to the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian military. Uh, we just help them a little bit along that journey. But I do think what is an untold story is the international partnership with the uh, special operations forces of multitude of different countries. I won't 
I won't name the number right now, but they have absolutely banded together in a, whole, a much outsized impact to uh, support the Ukrainian soft and the Ukrainian military and their efforts right now that I think is a great new story. And I think, I think that really bore out from the last 20 years of, of working together, sweating together, bleeding together in different battlefields on different continents. And some of these partners are new. There's been a coalescence and a joining of that unity of effort. It's absolutely inspiring to see uh, that itself is, uh, I think uh, you mentioned earlier, is something that our adversaries desire to have that we have. And that's really a gold standard, those international partnerships that can be part of the solution moving forward. Certainly we're taking tactical lessons learned and immediately trying to apply them to our schoolhouses and our other foreign partners for uh, everyone to learn as this uh, unfortunate conflict continues to unfold. Yeah, sometimes it's not ideal to share those lessons learned. Is, do you have any examples um, that you're comfortable well, it's impressive to see in just open press, you see the, the, uh, the impact that manned and unmanned drones and, and, and uh, teaming is having. I think that is an absolute critical growth area for United States Army Special Operations Command. It's one of our modernization priorities, one of our seven modernization priorities. I cannot envision a future battlefield without increased, ever increasing manned, unmanned robotics and the application of AI to maximize their effect and impact on across all warfighting functions. That's something we're looking at extremely closely and only seeing uh, growth in future uh, prioritization resources, training, and even possibly we're, ex we're experimenting of uh, what type of MOSs or branches or specialties are inside the Army Special Operations Command. So it's not just an additional duty, it's an actual specialty. Can, can you comment a little bit about how the, the cultural and uh, language, you know, training that Army Special Operations uh, operators receive and how that has helped in training um, our special operations uh, partners in other countries. Senator, it's imperative that we are both the culturally attuned uh, and, and speak the language. Now, do we speak the language of every country we go to? We, we can't really match that up, but we, we try, and we put a lot of effort into it. It's a baseline requirement coming out of the Special Forces uh, pipeline. Uh, it's maintained throughout through sustained uh, training, and perhaps most importantly, as we geographically align, I mean, our, our Special Forces groups and, and their civil affairs and PSYOPs teams, they stay regionally aligned. We're working in all geographical combatant commanders to this day and many of them have not taken their eyes off the ball under, to support the GCC commander's priorities there, be it SIMC teams, military information support teams, or special forces uh, uh, ODAs, or even uh, aviation detachments, uh, uh, advisory detachments. They're operating around the globe in support of every GCC commander's priorities, uh, but language is absolutely uh, critical to being uh, part of that interoperability. It's not just equipment. Uh, it also shows that you care. Before I turn it over to Senator Ernst here for the third or I guess fourth, third round of uh, questions. Um, uh, and I know this has been a focus uh, that the Army has had for decades, this language capability. But for uh, General Slife, Admiral Howard, General Glenn, is this uh, you know, something that your special operators are also focused on, or is it a capability you would like to integrate into the force in the future? Senator, specifically for AFSOC, because most of, uh, most of our operations deals either directly with aviation or with the integration of air and ground capabilities through joint terminal attack control and, and things of that nature. Uh, English is the international language of aviation, as you know. And so what we have found is that uh, our partners generally prefer uh, to do those security force assistance type activities in English because it is what they uh, what they deal with in the aviation world. So we don't see a, uh, a demand signal for increased language capability, although uh, to General Braga's point about cultural, uh, cultural training, cultural awareness, and those types of things, that is an area of investment for us as we think about security force assistance. Thank you, Senator. We have a modest investment. I think it's calibrated the right way. And we also uh, make an effort to uh, increasingly identify candidates that are coming in with natural language capability. Senator, language and culture have been part of our training pipeline since inception. And so every 
every critical skills operator that uh, is created or has been created over the course of the last 15 years goes through a language uh, unique to the theater in which we intend or they are most likely to deploy. So as you would hope, uh, like we have recently shifted to, to some of the more significant languages in Indo-PACOM AOR, to including Mandarin and Chinese. Thank you. Senator Ernst? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I know our vote has been called, so I'll, I'll just be brief. And if you can provide brief answers as well. Um, I did mention a little bit in my opening statement uh, the fact that SOCOM's budget is flat for this year uh, in what the president has submitted. So we know that that's less buying power with the rate of inflation uh, out there. So if, if you can um, talk through the impact that that will have on your ability to train and resource uh, and mobilize then your forces. Uh, I also noted that SOCOM submitted $650 million in unfunded requirements to buy down risk and to accelerate modernization, which really further reinforces the inadequacy of, of the budget as presented uh, by the president. So if you can, just very briefly, again, General Seif, we'll start with you. If you could talk about the impacts and what that will have on training, modernization, resourcing. Yes, Senator, uh, briefly, it, it delays, uh, you know, any resource shortfalls delays our ability to modernize. It delays our ability to maintain the force at the highest state of readiness. These are all balances. They're part of the risk calculus. And so I think you see, uh, as you characterized it, the SOCOM uh, unfunded priority list are those things that SOCOM believes uh, will buy down that risk to uh, to a lower level than mm -hmm. where we're carrying it right now. Great. Thank you. Senator, I, I echo the obviously the unfunded priority list will help buy down that risk by accelerating some of the capabilities we're looking to expand upon that we've been we've been talking about. Uh, I mentioned briefly that inflation is absolutely having an impact. It affects uh, our, our flying hour programs, or repair parts, repair engines, and, and that certainly have an impact. And what does that ultimately result in is, is you know, at the other end, reduced readiness if you don't have the, mm -hmm. the, the way to keep your, your uh, aircraft maintained and your crews up to speed just from an aviation type aspect. So it, it certainly has an impact. And at the ultimate end of the day, uh, can you put forward less into the, into the theaters to support the geographical combatant commanders if there's, if there's less resources? And I'd say that's that would be something we have to look at as we maintain uh, and, and restack our prioritization between training, readiness, modernization, and employment. Yeah, thank you. Admiral? Where I have a concern is really in, in readiness uh, mm -hmm. and the ability to, what we're seeing with the focus on experimentation and concept development for step changes to be ready for what's ahead. You know, we're seeing an increase in, in uh, requirements for, for for that experimentation and concept development and, and to get ready. Uh, where I see uh, you know, concern going forward is in unmanned systems, multi-domain right. with an emphasis mm -hmm. on software, not hardware, and that gets to the autonomy and interoperability. We have to win as a nation in, the, in, that, in that capability space. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Major Glenn, or General Glenn, excuse Senator. me, Major Glenn, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm good with that. Demoted you horribly. I'm good with that. I am so sorry, General back. Glenn. I'd go back and do that all over again. <laughs> a better day and age, maybe. <laughs> Senator, uh, as a component without major platforms, mm -hmm. uh, it boils down to people in our case. Mm -hmm. So, so it, the choice is in modernization, investments in modernization. How quickly can we go after the technological capability and expertise to understand our electromagnetic signature and our digital footprint mm -hmm. and to have an awareness of, the, of our adversaries. That would be one. It, the pace at which that change will occur is going to be impacted by resourcing. The alternative is to maintain a less, as has been alluded to by the other commanders, a less ready force or present a smaller force offering around the globe, which, which is not obviously not what we want to do because mm -hmm. we have long-standing relationships with allies and partners that we want to sustain. But, but that, that's where we're at as a component when it comes to that, that budget situation. Thank you. Uh, so I think all of your statements just further emphasized 
uh, that we do need to have growth within this component, within SOCOM and the budget um, to make sure that you are able to modernize, to make sure your readiness does not suffer, um, to make sure that we are able to fill the ranks and continue to fill the ranks in the future. Uh, you know, I've always had it hammered in my head to assume prudent risk, but at what point does that risk no longer present itself as prudent? And I think we need to continue to move forward with a robust um, budget, and it is something that I will be pushing for as we move into uh, our budget cycle through appropriations and with this National Defense Authorization Act. Um, and with that, I will have no more questions. Um, and so I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Ernst. And if, uh, um, I've, got a, I've got a few more. I want to try to get through them briefly. Um, so we can get to this vote at 30 minutes, people start to get nervous. And um, so, um, General Slife, you know, SOCOM's nearing a contract award for maybe up to 75 armed Overwatch uh, airframes, and uh, you know, this would provide reconnaissance and strike capabilities uh, to small geographically disaggregated teams of special operations forces. Can you articulate, articulate the requirement? for the armed overwatch program and explain why a new platform is more affordable and effective than existing platforms, including, you know, certainly for, you know, ground attack, the A-10, uh, but also for reconnaissance, something like the MQ-9. And just, uh, you know, a little bit about uh, on the requirements and the affordability effectiveness aspect of this. Thanks for the opportunity to talk about it, Senator. So a uh, couple of aspects to that. First of all, uh, our methodology for supporting our forces on the ground over the last uh, several decades has really boiled down to the, the development of what we uh, call an air stack over objective areas. And so you, you'll typically have single role specialized platforms, uh, AC-130s, A-10s, um, uh, MQ-9s, U-28s. You, you have this stack of airplanes over an objective each platform providing a niche capability to the force on the ground. Uh, that averages, in terms of cost per flying hour, uh, over $150,000 an hour is what it costs to generate kind of the typical stack for that. Uh, as we look at having a multi-role platform uh, in, the armed overwatch, um, in, in the armed overwatch concept, uh, that kind of multi-role uh, set of capabilities comes down to uh, something less than $10,000 a flight hour. So it is a, a much more efficient way to do that. Further, it allows us to push those platforms further forward into more austere areas where they can operate co-located with the ground teams that they're partnered with. And so uh, not having them have to fly from, you know, uh, hundreds of miles away, but rather being partnered uh, with the ground team that they'll be supporting uh, in places that, that have very austere uh, aviation support with a very light logistics footprint is really what we're after, Senator. How do you resolve the, the, like the issue of something like an AC-130 gunship being able to lay down a massive amount of, you know, you know fire uh, to the ground with something like, you know, an AT-6, um, you know, with a limited... Uh, is there... Has that been... Uh, well, well planned and thought out, Senator. I think it, I would say it depends on the mission uh, that is um, being contemplated, and so clearly there will be missions that require more uh, deep magazine fire support than what a uh, an armed Overwatch platform might have. But the idea of the armed Overwatch platform is it's a modular capability, and so you can outfit the aircraft. Uh, with a, a robust suite of sensors that will exceed what is available with uh, most um, dedicated ISR platforms today, uh, or you can outfit the, pl the platform with a robust suite of precision munitions. Uh, it, it really depends on the mission. And so clearly uh, the armed overwatch platform is not a panacea for every tactical situation that a ground force might find themselves in. Uh, but for what we envision the enduring counter VEO mission looking like, uh, we think it's a prudent investment. And when do you uh, feel that the contract award will be made? 
Senator, I think we're, we're um, uh, in months, uh, so this summer, I expect, uh, to see a contract award. All the uh, back and forth with industry, the uh, proposals have been received, all the questions have been answered, and at this point, the source selection team is going through their uh, deliberations and is going to make a recommendation uh, to the Milestone Decision Authority at SOCOM uh, here in the coming weeks, and then a contract will, will probably be awarded in the uh, prior to the end of the summer. Thank you. I have one final question for uh, General Braga. Um, you know, at, at, at present, uh, you know, sometimes obtaining approval uh, to drop a bomb um, is a lot easier than getting the permission to send a text message. So have you seen any improvement in the ability of your psychological operators uh, to gain the authorities and permissions necessary to operate effectively in the informa information environment? Uh, and if you haven't, I mean, what more do you f think we need to do? Senator, I have seen some improvement. In my professional opinion, in order to match the sheer capability and capacity of adversaries, collectively all of us need to be uh, expand that capability. Um, and we need to be able to move at the speed of the information environment, uh, which is uh, faster than perhaps we've been used to in, in, uh, in the past. So I think it requires new relationships. Uh, certainly, uh, we are investing our own uh, resources into expanding that capability and in information ops to support our psychological operations forces. Um, but it's, it's new ground for all, but it's, it's, uh, it's what, what we need to do to, in order to succeed both in competition and actually see for a role in high-end conflict as well. Um, so we have a long way to go. We're on a journey. We've seen some improvements. Uh, we're dedicating resources, times, effort, uh, effort and training towards it. Um, but absolutely look forward to working with uh, uh, the, the pen leadership at the Pentagon and, and our interagency partners uh, to inform you of any recommended changes moving forward. All right, please do. And uh, my door is always uh, open to all of you. I know Senator Ernst is as well. So anything you need, um, uh, you know, we want to we want to help. Also want to thank you, um, Generals Admiral, uh, for participating in this hearing today. And I look forward to continuing uh, to support you and uh, all the men and women at SOCOM, all 74,000. And uh, this hearing's adjourned. Thank you.